Okay. Um, thank you, Peter. Thank you, Alex. Alex, for having me here. Um, it's nice to meet you all. And um, for Professor Kozo, I'm, I'm glad he had to join, even though it was last minute. At least it, it made me feel it made me feel warmer having to see you, an African professor, or African lecturer here, who is into archaeology. So, um, my name is Belgam, and I'm talking about Silent Heritage Kindle series from Popo Kingdom. Next slide. Next slide. Yeah. Um, so um, a little bit about myself. Um, I'm a documentary photographer. I photograph and document endangered cultural heritages in southern Nigeria. Um, up to this day, I've curated about three exhibitions. And I'm also a member of the African Photojournalism Database for WordPress Photo. And more recently, I've become a 2022 cohort Mandela Washington Fellowship. And so like, these are basically like a little bit about me, but next slide. Yeah, um, in this photo here, you could see a man which um, Professor Konzo would know well. His name is King Jaja. A little story about him growing up as a boy, um, he was caught and sent to another community into slavery. But just before he was about being shipped out, he became ill and so they couldn't ship out the six slaves. And so he was domesticated. And he grew up learning the art and the craft of the palm oil trade, which was popular during the southern region of Nigeria, that then eastern region of Nigeria. And he grew to a point where he became very prosperous, even as a slave. And he rose to prominence of becoming the chief of his, of his house. And then he knew he wanted more, but he knew he couldn't get it where he wanted it. And so he decided to relocate and decided to go to a different region where he could still do his craft, he could still do his trade, but at the same time, he could be king over his land. And he found this kingdom, and this was actually called the Pupo Kingdom. And a funny story to it, because back then, he was not really a Christian, but he had no problems with Christianity. To even make it seem that he had no issues with Christianity, he founded his kingdom, a Pupo Kingdom, on the 25th of December, which signifies the same as the birth of Jesus, which signifies the birth of a new kingdom. So. That's a little bit story about King Jaja. Next slide. Yeah, um, so basically this is a Wokobo Kingdom. Wokobo Kingdom is located in rural state in the southern part of Nigeria. It was founded in 1870 by King Jaja who became the first treaty king and the natural born ruler of the kingdom. Well, from the image, from the map, you could see the area view of the kingdom. And um, from the left, you could see the governor to the current king and then Towards the bottom right, you could see a chief there, which is actually mighty because I'm from a global kingdom. So next slide. So, so basically, this is a remodeled building of um, the entrance of the palace of the king of a global kingdom. You could see on the buildings, you could see the manilas, which have been used to, they have been carved out and they've made a tree out of which is called the manila tree. You could see the swords, you could see the cannon which signifies power, which signifies authority. And this is the entrance to the king's palace. Next slide. So um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a photographer, so most of my presentations would be Victoria. And so this bell you see right here was given to King Jaja in 1877 by um, a Westerner called Wilson, who was a palm oil train merchant and he was a way of cultural exchange. And so, Ironically, coincidentally, my name is Belgam. So whenever I see a bell, it reminds me of home. So this bell could be found currently standing in the palace of the king. We've been making efforts in trying to preserve the bell to make sure it's in good order. And so this is our efforts in trying. Next slide. So um, like every new kingdom that's that is started, that is founded, um, it, it has governing rules and it has different cultures that are being borrowed and being brought together to form up his own culture. And so a Purple Kingdom was not a different kingdom. King Jaja had a particular chief called Chief Obomanu from Oriental House. And he was his lieutenant in terms of the palm oil trade. And so he went out trading the palm oil with the other sub-communities. And during one of his ventures, he found a masquerade group that he saw and he 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 loved how the masquerade performed and he actually, a year later, he became a member of the masquerade group and they handed over to him the male totem of the masquerade. 
which he took across the Imo River and which he brought to Obo Kingdom. And that was how we got the water masquerade. And we now turned it into a festival where we had different sub masquerade groups and different sub um, community groups that would dance. And at the end of it all, on the first of every year, the water masquerade would climb on the zinc and it would have a display. And towards the end of the display, he would jump from the zinc. He, it, it's quite, you, you, should, you should see it, it's quite amazing. Next slide. And so basically this is a traditional drum which is used for traditional plays in usually being beaten when the masquerade is out. It's usually used for ceremonial, ceremonial issues in the country, in the community. Next slide. Yeah, um, in terms of cultural exchanges, the Westerners came into Okobo Kingdom in River State and they were very enthusiastic about the palm oil trees and while doing business, there were different cultural exchanges. And in terms of cultural exchange for the white men, they went with the Manila, which was as a currency for them. And in terms of us, King Jaja was so fascinated about the architecture of the kind of buildings they had in the Western world. And he got, he fell in love with the Gothic architecture. And this building you're seeing right now signifies a Gothic building, which could be found in my hometown, my home community. And this building is, <laughs> In, in the Popo Kingdom, the Popo Kingdom is made up of 14 sub-houses, which are called the volcano houses. And each of these volcano houses have such buildings where the head of the house, which is called the chief or the alabo, which he stays. And so it's signified as the Deki building, as the house of the chief. And so we used to have 14 of these buildings for the 14 different sub-houses, but due to neglect or climate or whatever it was before, and you, we only have seven, and we are trying to see how we could preserve these seven buildings. Next slide. And yeah, so um, my presentation is geared towards more about the um, Kenu series. I just tried to give you like a preamble of what the community was all about and everything. And so um, in Opobo, in the, most of the city state communities, the riverine communities in Nigeria, um, we are known for having different Kenus where we, we use them for different activities, but it has mostly been generalized to the, in terms of fishing and basic transportation, but the whole more significances than this, and which I'm going to try to explain in the next few slides. Now, they are being separated into two different aspects. One, it's for the Watam Festival, which I talked about earlier, for the different dance groups, and it also signifies the return from battle. And then there's the second significance, which is the sub houses I talked about also, which is termed the polo or the gigi, and also as the installation of a chief. So these are two different segments I'm going to try to talk about in the future. So next slide. So this is a basic example of what a boat house looks like in the Pobo Kingdom. As you can see, it has a shed over its head. Traditionally, it is called an awari meaning a boat shed. And so every compound, every sub house has their own boat, their own walking room, and it is placed in such buildings. And so I just needed to give you an example of how the housing and the preservation was. I know it's a little bit Asian, but this is what we have. Next slide. So this is the creation of a walking room. So basically for any house to have a walking room, they, you, for any house to have a chief and have a walking in, you need to have at least 30 good young men who could go out to fight, who could go out for wars, who could paddle your walking in. And this you're seeing is the creation of a walking in, as you can see. It has like two different compartments in the walking in. And the first compartment is usually for the drummers during every war. You can't go to war without music. And so the second compartment down there is usually for the chiefs. And you can see just in front, it has this flat board. And in the next slide, I will show you who sits on this flat board. Next slide, please. And so in terms of the different significances of the walking, the first which I mentioned about um, the Watam Festival. So every December, from around 24th of December to the 31st of December, you have different of these masculine groups. And what they do is that they go to a neighboring community and then they paddle back to the community. 
the first significance of that is to signify how they went to war and they came back victorious in battle. The second significance of how the water mass with how it started and from the community it migrated from to the current community, which is our community. And so if we go to the next slide, you could see a different masquerade group all doing the same thing, all parallel. And these different masquerade groups, they have like different colors which they wear. And since it became a festival, there were prizes attached to it. And so every masquerade group wanted to be the best. They wanted to beat everybody. Now we have about seven, eight different masquerade groups that you see them out there partly looking very colorful. I would basically rent the boat and be beside them and take photographs and enjoy the good music. Next slide. Yeah, so um, this is still another image, like I said, mostly Victoria because I'm a photographer. Another image of them paddling and singing and having been merry and everything. Next slide. Yeah, um, so like I said, the second aspect has to do with the polo, the walking. Now, for you to have a walking or for you to bring out a walking, you need to have a chief, which signifies the head of the walking house. And this is actually my own house. It's actually called the Okono Polo. And then you could see our, our color is, is yellow, which signifies what we stand for. And then our own totem is a dog, which is a bulldog. And if you go to the next slide, you could see the arrangement and the preparation. This is how it's being prepared. And mostly when you have a polo pad, which is different from the water pad, the polo pad signifies two things. One it signifies the migration of when they left, when King Jaja and his chiefs, like to call them Jesus and his twelve disciples, when they left their previous community to the community they founded. And so the second significance also of when you see these big boats, this walking is being paddled, it signifies the installation, the installation of the chief. When a new chief is being installed, they have to also do the same thing also, go to a neighboring community and then paddle back. Next slide. Next slide. So, um, like I said, um, this image was taken from the 2020 celebration when the community celebrated 150 years. I took this image of um, the community of my polo. Next slide. And that's just me at work. Next slide. Yeah, and so what differentiates between a Watam festival and a polo paddle, usually you would find an umbrella where the chief or the alabo sits in, which you can see right here. And this particular walking is called Chief Captain Ranta. And this, from this walking who has, this was a walking who has that actually brought the Watam Festival. And so their founder was actually called a captain. And this being called a captain, that was why when he saw me about the kid, his photograph, he stood up because captains don't see them basically. And so the way of differentiating is you'd see the umbrella look signifying that there's a chief in that walking. And that was the way you differentiate between the, um, the Watam Festival and the Polo Paddles. Next slide. Now, um, this, this is a very historical picture because um, this is the original walking of the first ever King Jaja, the King Jaja the first of Okobo Kingdom. This is his own walking and it's been written down in history that whenever he brought out this walking, he has never lost a battle. And so it's called the Asujeki. And um, unlike other um, war polos, like basically there are no drums, basically you don't see and you don't find a umbrella because um, when he goes out for war, see, historically, like the king needs to be protected and so they're all covered, all designed in black, everybody with black raffias and black all over. And unlike the other polos who paddle at the middle, they paddle by the side of the mangrove. And so if you go to the next slide, you will see a picture of what it looks like. When, so this is basically what, how there is, as you could see, all black, you did no dramas, nothing. And so basically this is, and this is a historic, like, I believe this volcano has been preserved since the 1870s. I can't really date when it was built, but I know it's, it's been over even so long and so. Next slide. And yeah, uh, I took this photograph, I took this photograph early this year. And um, 
the photograph reminds me of a lot because I keep asking myself, like, I, I was, last December, I saw a friend who was actually watching the boat paddling and I asked him, do you understand what you're watching? He said, yeah, 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 now he loves the whole aesthetics. He, he was able to list the different names of the mass people. I like, no, do you understand the significance behind what you're watching? And he said, no. And I felt sad because I, I used to be that way like some couple of years back before I started documentary photography. And this made me realize that in terms of crime, heritage crime, heritage crime is not just, just tangible. There are also intangible heritage crimes in terms of who are we passing the knowledge to? Who are we, the next generation? What are they, what are they, what are they having? Like, there's basically no documentation. It's mostly word of mouth. And over the years, this word of mouth, they get swatted. And so I decided to go, I decided to go more into preservation, into cultural heritage preservation and then, Early this year, I was in Lagos, Nigeria, where I enrolled for the British Library Endangered Archive Program. And from there, I learned a little bit about how to digitize and how to really preserve culture. And I got selected for the Mandela Washington Fellowship, which I just recently returned from, from the United States, where I was able to understand public policy. At the same time, I met with some archaeologists. I don't know if Professor Kenzo, if you'd know, um, Professor Christopher Decor. I was able to meet him, amazing anthropologists and, um, and archaeologists. And, and then he introduced me to photogrammetry. I was able to see how to use tech to digitize and how to use tech to preserve culture and heritage. So rounding up, I, I, I basically want to preserve culture and heritage for the next generation because the historians are passing on. And so um, if you go to the final slide, I want to thank you for having me here. Those are my contact information. I really, I, I see what you guys have over there from the last two speakers. I see how far you guys have come in terms of geomapping and satellite imagery and everything. And we're still so young, so down here. And so we're trying to see how we could come up to that level, that platform where we could digitize and document and have something to keep for the next generation. And, I literally have literally I have a first degree in computer science and mathematics, but I'm switching to cultural archaeology and anthropology because I have to preserve and it's it's a good way for me to mix ICT and art and you know. So um thank you, Peter. Thank you, Alice. Thank you guys for listening to me. And uh, that's my presentation.